Hello, this is Garland Nixon here with Helga Zaplarouche. You will forgive me if I uh, mispronounce your name, but um, we're here today to discuss the um, extraordinary revelations that have come out by Seymour Hirsch about the uh, Nord Stream, uh, the attack on the Nord Stream pipeline. Helga, uh, you are in Germany at this time. Uh, what are your thoughts on um, the um, the impact of this on the German citizens, and of course, whether or not it's actually getting out in the media and how much people know about it? Well, I think it is uh, very interesting. Um, basically, the mainstream media are trying to either not report it or make, you know, ridiculous. Yesterday, there was a little discussion in the Bundestag where one rather youngish uh, CDU parliamentarian, uh, you know, that basically tried to discredit Seymour, Seymour Hirsch by saying, oh, this 85-year-old guy, you know, who 50 years ago got a prize for journalism, as if Seymour Hirsch would not be the most uh, integer and decorated investigative journalist uh, probably in the whole Western world. Uh, and it, it is amazing because you can see that Everybody who, who has thought about it, who has looked at the facts, you know, starting with, for example, the former foreign minister of Austria, Karin Kneisel, uh, she gave an interview where she said that it was clear to her many years ago, long before this happened, that the United States was uh, not intending to ever let this uh, pipeline become operational. And, you know, if you have that intention in mind and then look at what Biden said on February 7th when Scholz was standing there beside him like a little schoolboy. I mean, here is Biden saying, you know, we have the means to make sure this pipeline will be uh, finished. And then Scholz stands there and he doesn't say a mumbling word. I mean, look, I mean, it, it is right now becoming very, very clear that, you know, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I only can go by what Seymour Hirsch is saying and that what other sources have been saying. I talked to a lot of military people in Europe and they all concur that given the fact that the uh, Baltic Sea is one of the most surveyed pieces of uh, earth, you know, anywhere because of the Cold War, because of, you know, the proximity of, of Russia and so forth, there is no way how this could have done without the United States either knowing about it, approving of it, or having it done themselves. I mean, that, it's simply a, a, a technical impossibility. So in light of that, which must be known to all German intelligence services and politicians in the, in the upper echelons, to then stand up and say, oh no, this was the Russians, it's so blatant, you know, and I personally think this will not go away. Because, you know, there, there may be an attempt to cover up, but I think the longer they wait, it will get worse because the trust in the government defending the interest of the population will get eroded more and more and more because the consequences of this is that energy prices have increased so much that it threatens the livelihood of many people. The lower income bracket, you know, are, are really having a hard time to even... Uh, get to the end of the month, many small and medium businesses go bankrupt. There is a threat of deindustrialization of Germany. So this is not just something, you know, this has consequences in the real world, which hits the common people. And therefore, you know, given the fact that many people already suspect uh, what Seymour Hirsch is saying, I think this, the longer the cover up goes, the worse it will get. You know, what you brought up something that I think um, is very important. I'd like to get your thoughts on it. And that is the question of who the ruling elite class represents. The question of whether or not they represent the people or whether or not that they are the comprador class, as they would say in Africa, whether or not they are simply um, people who work for the neocons in Washington, D.C., work for the U.S. empire, and that they ensure that the dictates of the U.S. empire are exacted upon the German people, um, that it's a top-down um, uh, control uh, paradigm instead of an actual democratic paradigm. Do you think the German people, and, and adding to that, the fact that <clears throat> the bases, it's clearly now, it's clear now that the military bases, the U.S. military bases 
our bases of occupation as opposed to, you know, Cold War style defense from Russia. Your thoughts on that dynamic and whether or not um, you think that will be is becoming either discussed or apparent in Germany? Well, right now, you know, I think that because of this disgusting obedience of this present ruling coalition in Germany to the dictate of London and, and Washington, because don't forget London, because they are uh, among the warmongers, uh, always number one, as you could see by the various deployments of Boris Johnson in, in the Ukraine, when there was a possibility of negotiations, he flew in and basically ruined it. And in the recent period, you had several British generals who said NATO should confront Russia directly, boots on the ground in Ukraine. So, you know, I do not <coughs> underestimate the role of the British in that. But the fact that the German government lets itself be drawn into this scenario by, you know, delivering more heavy weapons to Ukraine, uh, you know, howitzers at a point, then light tanks and heavy tanks and now the demand for fighter jets. You know, a year ago, Scholz said, you know, he does not want to send any more weapons, especially not heavy weapons to Ukraine, because that increases the danger of World War III. And now he's doing it. So, you know, I mean, this is unbelievable. And I think that that, uh, you know, servility uh, is, is really something which we have to mobilize the population uh, against because this is the existence of Germany which is at stake. What, what they are doing, you know, in, in not talking about, I mean, what do you need en enemies for if you have friends like that? I mean, give me a break. I mean, I think this Nord Stream 2 or Nord Stream pipeline sabotage in its implication is enormous. And I think the ruling elite, they're not so much an elite, but uh, an establishment, um, the implication of that is enormous. I mean, if you think that you are in a NATO alliance where, you know, the big bully is uh, using its uh, capabilities to knock down the pipelines of an ally, you know, and that means, you know, that then now the United States can sell expensive LNG gas uh, to compensate for the cheap Russian gas. If Germany swallows this, they're lost. That's my view. You know, something I'm glad, you know, I, I certainly, we certainly do want to discuss um, what we can do um, to address this, but you brought up something else that I think is critical, and that is the issue of the, uh, as an ally, of an alliance, of the NATO being an alliance. If we look at Norway, um, uh, according to um, the article, to Cy Hirsch's work, um, the U.S. approached Norway, and Norway looked at it as a business opportunity. That we okay, well, we can sell gas and this will work out for us. So Germany was it, there wasn't even a discussion or thought as to whether or not Germany would be attacked. Furthermore, we saw Poland. Um, we saw um, Radislav Sikorsky, I believe it was, immediately afterwards, a very you know well known and high ranking, formerly high ranking German uh, Polish official, celebrating on Twitter unabashedly. Um, the your thoughts on the dynamics of being able to maintain the facade now that this is an alliance to protect countries from a Russian invasion as opposed to, you know, a captured group of a group of captives who are held under coercive means together by a um, basically an, a, an imprisonment in a political um, uh, 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 economic. And now we see military imprisonment under the threat of violence and coercion. Well, I would add what Liz Truss said, you know, the moment the pipeline was blown up, she tweeted to Blinken or sent a message to Blinken, we did it, you know, instantly. So, you know, I think the NATO question will be eroded by this because, you know, I mean, right now there is a, a the NATO as it was formed uh, as a defensive alliance against the Soviet Union has clearly undergone a transformation <clears throat> where they are now becoming increasingly the tool of the unipolar world. I mean, this is not hidden, this is open, you know. At the recent uh, uh, meeting of uh, NATO in June in Madrid last year, they, they said, now we go for global NATO, and they are moving very rapidly uh, to do that. 
uh, recently there was an agreement between the EU, was it von der Leyen and NATO, to, ha to basically have an alliance between the two, whereby a member of one is automatically, you know, access for the member of every, uh, of the other one, every one. So it's, it's a total interlinking. Now, have I been asked if I agree that, you know, I'm being part of the European Union, that I want to be part of global NATO, and, you know, it's not just the EU NATO, you have the uh, AUKUS, this is the military alliance between the United States, Australia, and UK. Then you have the military agreement between Japan and the UK, the so-called reciprocal access agreement. Uh, so you have an interwoven network of military alliances for what? You know, the, the only aim is the showdown uh, with first Russia, naturally, but then with China. And you had this uh, U.S. Uh, general, I think, Mini, Miniham or some name like that, who said basically, uh, you know, it, uh, there will be a war with uh, China over Taiwan in two years by 2025. And then you have the rent study, you know, which said basically let's not have a long war in, in Ukraine because, you know, we basically must have ammunition and every resource ready for the coming confrontation with China. And I don't want to have an in, in a showdown with China because I think this whole thing is so insane. Why should we continue to go for a confrontation which can only end up in World War III? And if it comes to World War III, that will be the end of civilization because as several nuclear experts have clearly demonstrated, there is no such thing as a limited nuclear war because it is the nature of nuclear war that once one weapon is used, all of them will be used. And that means there will be a nuclear winter of 10 years minimum, which will destroy the life of everybody who has survived the first hours and first weeks. So that will be the end of life on the planet. And that's what these people are playing with. And this is why I think this idea of global NATO and what it implies needs a much broader discussion than we are having it right now. Now, let's move forward. There's Heaven knows there's plenty. One of the things I'd like to talk with you about at some time is <clears throat> you have to look at the relationship between Germany and China and say, well, Germany has a very significant economic, um, just for so something for our viewers to think about. Germany has a very significant economic um has has very significant economic ties to Germ to China, and if they think that the United States don't have a Nord Stream two style plan to uh, sl slice their um, their their economic ties to China the same way, they would be sadly mistaken. <laughs> that something you know, whether it's their ships, ports, something will get blown up. Something really bad will happen when once they tell um, they warn uh, Germany to uh, sever their ties with 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 uh, China, which in fact would be the absolute economic destruction of Germany. But let's move forward because I think this is important. Um, your thoughts, you know, we uh, I'm one of the speakers at an, a very uh, important uh, event called um, Rage Against the War Machine, in which people of various um, ideologies, groups and organizations are coming together for a common goal. Your thoughts about how the the method to move forward, um, a path forward to try to address these these challenges and dangers that we face. Well, I think that there are several things which can be done. And I think to get as many people out in the streets to demonstrate for peace is extremely important. You know, I mean, uh, Gilbert Doktorow, who is a, an American living in Brussels, who is, uh, you know, very uh, knowledgeable about military affairs, he wrote in a recent article that he thinks that the war danger is so advanced that the only thing which can stop it is masses in the streets. And, you know, so I can only encourage anybody who, who is capable to do so should join the demonstration on the 19th in Washington. I think there are some parallel uh, demonstrations in LA and other places. One week later, on the 25th, we have a big demonstration in uh, Berlin. Uh, we are right now working with other groups in Germany and Europe to encourage that parallel demonstrations should take place in as many uh, places as possible. So I think this is extremely important because, you know, if there would be 
large numbers, you know, I mean, think about the demonstrations in East Germany in 1989, you know, once it reached a certain size, there was nothing the, the government could do. You know, so I think that the, the key question is to get as many people as possible. But I, I would also like to introduce two other venues, um, two other um, instruments to fight against the war. And that is, you know, the Schiller Institute had uh, recent conferences with Latin American legislators and others. Uh, and out of that came an open letter to Pope Francis because the Pope has offered the venue of the Vatican as the place to have unconditional peace negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. Now, as of now, Russia doesn't want to negotiate because after Merkel and Hollande admitted that they were cheating and lying concerning their pursuing the Minsk Accord, Russia doesn't think that anybody in the West is trustworthy, and they have the opinion that the decision, the decision must become on the battlefield in Ukraine. And the United States and NATO on the other side think Ukraine must win, Russia must be defeated. So this is set to a terrible confrontation which could go awfully wrong. So, so it's not so much to support the Pope. The Pope has made a very important proposal, but to support that initiative is a way of making more people aware of the danger and what we want is we're calling on all religious leaders. Uh, Pax Christi, they have done already a lot. They were at our recent conference of the Schiller Institute participating from the United States. But we want all clergymen, all bishops, cardinals, uh, imams, uh, other representatives, if all the religions would come out right now and you know unite around the Pope and say this war must stop, because it has the danger of going completely out of control, and therefore we all support uh, the Pope's initiative. This would be a way of waking up the world population. The Catholics have more than a billion people, the Muslims another more than a billion people, other religions have similar numbers. So I think I would urge you, know, you and all people uh, watching this uh, to support this uh, signed letter to the Pope uh, because you need a figure above politics. And, you know, people said, why the Pope? I don't like the Pope. That's not the point. You need an institution which is more than 2,000 years old and a rallying point for all people of goodwill to come together. So that is another venue. And then I have a third, uh, a third one, uh, and that is that, you know, I mean, if you look at the strategic situation from the top, you see that we have, as mankind, reached clearly an impasse. Because if you have NATO, the US on the one side, Russia, China, and the global south on the other side, you know, there must be a way of resolving this because we are the human species gifted with creative reason and we should be able to come up with a solution to an apparent dilemma at the end of which stands our extinction. So I have made a proposal for a new international security and development architecture, which must take the interest of every nation on the planet into account. And this is modeled on the Peace of Westphalia, which ended 150 years of religious war in Europe, of which the 30 years war was just the last phase. And they came up with principles which were the basis for international law, uh, the most important of which being that any peace order must take into account the interest of the other, namely every other. So uh, in that tradition, I have uh, suggested that we should have such an international architecture, a new architecture, and I have proposed 10 principles uh, not points, but principles, because they all belong together to a coherent approach. Um, and I would like people to read that. And I would really encourage people to start a serious discussion of how should the world order be reorganized for us as a human species to have a long-term survivability, because that is really what's at stake. 
So these are the three venues I can see, you know, mass demonstrations, open letter to the Pope, new security architecture, and I think all three must be pursued. One of the other things that we're seeing, particularly in Europe, we've seen it in the South America, you know, a few uh, years back, I believe it was 2019, um, Bolivia's government fell, the people came to the streets and they did um, <clears throat> mass work stoppages. And that forced the government um, to to give them a, a, a vote. We see some of that starting to fire up in the UK. We see some of it starting uh, to happen in France. What are your thoughts on the potential for um, workers to um, act in a manner that uh, puts economic pressure on their leaders? I think it is very big because, you know, in France, uh, we are in the middle of it. You know, we have an organization in France called Solidarité et Progrès, uh, and we are working in an alliance with all kinds of sovereignists uh, from the right and the left. And we are trying to do exactly what you are trying to do in Washington by not having political division because nobody will survive if we keep uh, quarreling about minor points when the existence of everybody is at stake. So in France, uh, the people who are now on the street, the official reason is the change in the pension uh, reform, the pension plan. But if you ask people in the street, you know, why are you here? They say it's about everything. It's about our future. It's about France. Uh, it's about, you know, can we uh, have any kind of, of, of life? Uh, because that's, that's really what's threatened. In Great Britain, you see the same thing. You know, you have one strike after the other. And there it is also the existential interest of, of the people. In Germany, you know, it, there has there has been significant demonstrations a couple of months ago. Then it uh, became a little bit less. But, you know, I think that right now when people really realize that they are hit with an inflation in energy prices, in, in food prices, um, I think this will be, again, a, a big factor. So, you know, it is that basically the people have lost trust in their governments because they have a de definite feeling that these governments, uh, even if they have made an oath to defend the interests of the people and protect them against damage, they're not acting on that basis. So we have a real crisis of confidence in the present system in, I would say, all of Europe. You know, and finally, and I think this is critical, you know, um, people tend to feel disempowered. They tend to feel, yes, in the aggregate, big things can happen. But as an individual, why I'm just working and trying to feed my family and raise my kids, what can I do? How can I, what would you say to someone who has that level? You know, and, and of course, the system, the powerful people um, take advantage of that. You know, they put people in a position where they have to work long hours and they really don't have time to do things and they the news uh, misinforms people. What would you say to the average indivi individual who feels like they don't have strength or power or time to act? Well, Schiller, who is, you know, the German poet of freedom and according to whom the Schiller Institute is uh, named, uh, he said in, I cannot say it in English as well as he does in German, but he says, if you can't be a, a whole, a totality, then attach yourself to a whole. Um, which means, you know, if you go as one person on the street and you hold up a poster and say, I want peace, nobody will listen to you. But if you are part of a growing movement, uh, then you can be extremely effective and, you know, Schiller also uh, said that there is no contradiction between being a patriot and a world citizen. Now, I think this is very important because the fact that there is a danger of world war makes everybody automatically a world citizen because the whole world is at stake. So at these conferences uh, we had in the recent month, uh, we have issued a call uh, world citizens of all countries unite. Now I'm coming from Trier, and you know this is also the birthplace of a famous uh, son of Trier, namely Karl Marx, uh, and he is famous of having said proletariats of all proletarians of all countries unite. So I have you know varied that a little bit by saying world citizens of all countries unite. Because I think what we need is a movement of world citizens who say, 
it is our world and we take responsibility to make a future which gives a possibility to survive for every individual on the planet. We have to eradicate hunger, poverty. Uh, we have to have a modern health system in every country. We have to give a universal education to every child. Uh, we have to have a credit system which finances all of that to, for the common good and not make the billionaires more rich and the billions poorer, because that is the system we are having right now. And, you know, I have written down all of these ideas in these 10 principles. And I think that, you know, we have to really, uh, you know, change the way we think. Uh, the United States is a republic, according to the Constitution, according to the American Revolution. And, you know, America must find back to become a republic, you know, not to become part of an Anglo-American empire running a unipolar world, which because that unipolar world is gone already. There is no way how it will come back. You have right now the global south, which is re-emerging, you know, the non-aligned movement, which was basically defeated in the 70s because, you know, many people were destabilized. Uh, Bandara Naiki, Indira Gandhi, Bhutto was killed. So the non-aligned movement was, was uh, you know, basically reduced in its weight for a long time. But now they have come back, you know, and they're demanding an overcoming of the underdevelopment and they don't want to continue with colonialism in new clothes. So you have right now a new system emerging and, you know, it is not hostile to America. I think this is the biggest lie by the mainstream media because, for example, China is not an enemy of the United States. I mean, you can make anybody into an enemy. You know, if I poke in your eye and say, what an ugly character you are, you know, I can get the most peaceful person to hate me. But China has offered many times to cooperate with the United States in building a new system. And, you know, I can only say that, you know, I have been in China the first time in 71 as a young journalist and... I have seen what an incredible development China has made from a country which was as poor as, let's say, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and now they are, you know, if you go to an airport or an, uh, air, a main station, they are clean, they are, the trains are in time, they have a fast train system of 40,000 kilometers of fast train which go uh, 270 miles an hour. Uh, they are now building a maglev train of 600 kilometers an hour, you know, and, you know, the United States should do this to themselves. Why don't the United States start to build a, a fast train system inside the United States? Why, that, why don't they cooperate with uh, China, with Russia, with India, with uh, Argentina, with Indonesia, with Nigeria? to reconstruct Southwest Asia, which has been destroyed by these interventionist wars. Why don't they cooperate in the building up of Africa, which is the continent of the future? By 2050, Africa will have 2.5 billion people. You know, that means we have to create at least a billion modern productive jobs for all these young people. Uh, and there's lots, there is so much work to do that you don't need to have competition, you can have cooperation. And I think that that is something we have to really put on the table. And, you know, I think this demonization of, of other countries is really devastating. And it just is a spiral out of which there is no escape. So we have to stop that, step away back, you know, and maybe it's an old fashioned idea, but the idea of turning, um, you know, weapons into plowshares uh, would be really good, you know. You can build new cities inside the United States. Go to the Midwest. Uh, you know, the, the middle states of the United States are totally underpopulated. There's very little development. You could build new science cities, you know, beautiful cities. Um, and there is, it's not without an alternative to, to head towards World War III. So I think we should enter a discussion in that and um, you know, it's only one word which we have and we better make sure we keep it.
Thank you, Helga Zap uh, LaRouche. Um, I think this was a you know a, a, an excellent interview. I certainly appreciate um your your uh, your brilliant points and I hope that um um, people take into account what you said, and I would recommend that people watching this interview share it on all your social media platforms and recommend it to all your friends. Thank you, Helga. Thank you.